specifically, we have uh, guests from the International Atomic Energy Agency. They're here to, uh, to do some uh, reactor physics training with our faculty. But uh, I know that a lot of you have interest in what they do. Um, for those of you that do, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask after the, the seminar is over that our, our visitors will come to the front. Uh, Tatiana, can you stand up? Sure. Tatiana Jeremovic, uh, she's the uh, point of contact. And so I would ask that if any of you have interest, whether you want to do future work, research, uh, uh, employment, anything like that, that, uh, that they'll come up after the closure, and then you can interface with them. Uh, and it will give you an opportunity to talk to them and to ask questions, uh, ask what they do, um, uh, their background, and all these kinds of things uh, at the end of the seminar. Does that make sense? OK, do we have any questions on that? Because what, what they've been doing is kind of exciting. They've been doing some workshops here uh, with our faculty. So uh, you know, kind of put that out there as an opportunity for you to meet them and for them to meet you. Does that make sense? It's all good? It's all good. All right. And so a point of contact, uh, Tatiana back. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, start a little bit early because I've got a whole bunch of biographies. Because what we're going to do is we're going to have each of our students go uh, basically back to back. Uh, in terms of what they did for their summer internships uh, this past summer at, in the National Laboratory Complex. And so I'm just going to read uh, their biographies, and they're just going to, one after another, come up to the front and give their presentations. <coughs> OK? All right, so let's start with uh, our first one. Uh, Ryan O'Mara, he's a PhD candidate studying retrospective dosimetry applications to uh, for nonproliferation and nuclear fuel characterization under the advisement of Dr. Hayes. This past summer, Ryan held an internship at Oak Ridge National Lab. There he worked with the SCALE team on adding new analysis capabilities for stochastic uncertainty propagation analysis. Part of this work included kernel density estimator analysis to uh, adding that to the sampler package in SCALE, which I'm extremely biased. I think it's extremely bit, uh, uh, brilliant uh, stuff that he did. Um, and I think every software, every uh, Monte Carlo software package out there should have this. Uh, and, I, and I would defend that. <laughs> That's just my bias. The second speaker, Joseph Cole, is also a PhD student here in our nuclear engineering department. And he got his bachelor's degree in nuclear engineering in 2018 here from North Carolina State University. He's currently doing research under Dr. Dmitry Anastrokhov, back in the corner. Uh, and his thesis work is on reduced order modeling for thermal radiative transfer, transfer problems. Should be very interesting. And then the last speaker is going to be Anil Gurgan. He's a PhD student in, nu in nuclear engineering here at the Department of uh, Nuclear Engineering at North Carolina State University. He got his bachelor's degree in nuclear engineering in 2013 from Hasatepe. I don't know if I said that right. No. Hasatepe, OK. Hasatepe University, Turkey. The master's degree of nuclear engineering from 2018 from, uh, he got from MIT. He's currently involved in the ARPA-E project, development of a nearly autonomous management and control system for advanced reactors. And he's doing his research under the supervision of Dr. Dan. So also important. His research mainly focuses on identifying requirements and uncertainties in machine learning algorithms that can be used to predict future states of reactor and transient conditions. So everybody, please keep your time to 15 minutes so that we can finish on time and have questions, and then everybody can meet our IAEA guests. So Ryan, take it over. All right, thanks, Dr. Hayes. Uh, as you heard, I'm Ryan O'Mara. I'm one of Dr. Hayes' students currently. Uh, this summer, I was at Oak Ridge National Lab working with the SCALE team. Um, so this presentation I actually gave at the SCALE users group uh, meeting this summer. So I'm just going to kind of bounce around and give you a high-level overview of uh, one of the projects I worked on and uh, hopefully convince you if you're a SCALE user that this will be useful to you. Um, I'm not a SCALE user or a SCALE expert, so if you have SCALE-specific questions, there's probably someone else that can answer those better than I can. Uh, so to start out, I'll just give you a brief introduction. Um, I'll kind of give you an explanation of what we're calling kernel density estimators for this particular type of problem. I'll go through a couple of sample problems that we ran. Uh, another caveat is I actually made and gave this presentation before I uh, finished the coding portion of it. So all the plots you'll see are indicative of what you get in scale now or will get in scale in beta 7 release, uh, but they weren't made in scale. They were made external. Um, we'll probably skip over this implementation and conclusions because it's been implemented. implemented, um, And so uh, when I originally gave this talk, I was asking for scale users to say, how do, how do you want this to work? How would it work best for you? Uh, but that ship has sailed. So 
uh, kind of the, the problem that we're tackling here is that a lot of times um, in my work and, and other analysts' work, uh, we go out and make a measurement, and then we go and we simulate that measurement situation, and we try to make the simulation and the measurement match. Um, and a lot of times we take into account some uncertainties, basically the easy uncertainties, so you say the uncertainty and maybe the source strength or other things. Uh, what we don't do a lot of is taking into account the nominal uh, parameters within a certain simulation and how they affect our results. So when I say nominal parameters, I mean source detector distance, uh, source extent, um, things that are in the room, the isotopics of the floor, all of these things can have an effect on um, our results on the simulation and how they relate to the measurement. Uh, the problem with those sorts of kind of parameters and their uncertainties is it's not really easy uh, to do our normal perturbation approach where we can come up with a nice equation and do adjoint sensitivity analysis, describe uncertainties that way. Uh, so we kind of fall to this uh, stochastic uncertainty quantification. So basically, stochastic uncertainty quantification is just brute forcing it. You define a parameter space for uh, the parameter that is uncertain, uh, and you perturb it within that space, simulate, perturb, simulate, perturb. Um, so if you think about it, it's kind of like uh, the same thing you do with an individual Monte Carlo simulation, but you do it with the parameters and then go into your Monte Carlo simulation. Um, it's kind of a pain to do this by hand. If you think about, say, I want to do a thousand perturbations of some parameter. Uh, if I were to do this by hand, that means I'm making a thousand input files and running them and collecting all those results, doing the uh, analysis from there. Luckily for scale users, there's this module called Sampler. Uh, basically, Sampler is a wrapper that goes around any module in scale and can do that perturbation step for you. So it'll sample the parameters that you define as uncertain, make your input files, run those input files, collect the results, and give you a nice uh, little small suite of uh, statistics from the, those perturbations. So <clears throat> kind of basically, as I said, the, you get these kind of basic uh, response statistics. So it'll give you the mean of the response you're looking at, the standard deviation, it'll throw up some histograms. Uh, the two kind of what we call problems, uh, they might, problem might not be the correct word, but um, kind of challenges when it comes to this sort of work is that uh, when you have these simulated results, you get some uncertainty in that simulated response value that you're looking at. Uh, so if you just throw this into a histogram, uh, that requires you to just throw out that uncertainty. So you lose that Monte Carlo uncertainty bit. Uh, another problem is, is histograms are really kind of sensitive to when you define the bin width. So actually, in sampler, you don't get to define the bin width, but the bin width that's defined for you kind of determines what your final histogram looks like. So if you think about, uh, you do a bunch of these perturbations. If you make your bin edges on the extrema of the perturbed values, you just get one block. So that's not very useful. Um, it's kind of that same thing. Your resolution scales with the bin width to a point, then goes down. You end up with, if you go too many bins, you get the blades in the grass view, so it just looks like a bunch of sticks. Um, so one solution, or kind of what we're calling a solution, is instead of just making your histograms, you do kernel dis density estimator analysis. Uh, so this is one of the bits that I added to Sampler this summer. So we'll get into kernel density estimators. Um, so a kernel density estimator, basically uh, what it's doing or what, what we're doing with it is saying, uh, we have this measured value, it has some uncertainty. Instead of saying like, that measured value is a bit in a bin, we say, well, what happens uh, if you include the uncertainty? So instead of just having the bin value, the bin value, you have what's a Gaussian center, basically. So you take it and you say, uh, the simulation response value is the mean of some Gaussian curve defined by the uncertainty, which gives you the standard deviation of that curve. Uh, so what we do is we say uh, the final kernel density estimate is just the sum of all these little Gaussian centers. So you can kind of follow uh, starting here. This is your general kernel density uh, function. Just saying we apply some kernel function. For this case, we apply a Gaussian kernel. Uh, you apply that to each one of your data, sum up, and you, uh, your final sum over all those numbers is your uh, final kernel density estimate. So it takes you from something that looks kind of like this. So this is uh, calculated versus expected values for U2, U233 uh, criticality testing um, cases. So this is the histogram data. We apply the kernel density with the Gaussian kernel here. 
add them up and you get a, uh, a nice smooth picture, a pretty picture. Uh, so one thing, the reason I put this up here is uh, you kind of get, if you compare these two, uh, you can see where you kind of get a benefit with the KDE. So in the histogram data, it looks like you might have some left side tailing. Um, when you apply the kernel density estimate and take into account those uncertainties, you actually get this visible bump here. So it kind of looks like you might have a superposition of two Gaussians. So that's kind of the features uh, that we're looking for here. So uh, just another kind of schematic view of how this works. You take your histogram data, each point in each one of these bins becomes a uh, Gaussian distribution. Um, so this is just all of those made into a Gaussian laid on top of each other sum up, you get this PDF. So, uh, so this is not really in the traditional mathematics sense what a kernel density estimator is. Uh, this is what is actually called a weighted histogram. Um, but if you kind of stand back at 50 feet and squint a little bit, this is basically what a kernel density estimator is, except using almost using an adaptive bandwidth parameter, um, but uh, more rightfully named the weighted histogram. Um, so kind of the claim that we make is if you have that uncertainty, uh, the best you can do for an estimate of a sample is that the uh, sample is normally distributed in, within the uncertainty. Um, so that's kind of where this falls out of, this is what you add up. So for the first sample problem, so when I first got to Oak Ridge, um, I was working with the criticality safety team and we were looking at uh, how does this kernel density estimator stuff look just on uh, the uh, criticality data. So when you take, when you're looking for biases and criticality data, basically what you do is you take this suite of uh, simulations and then your case of measurements, you divide the expected. Uh, so the measured, you divide the simulated value by the measured value. You look at what the biases are and you basically, you histogram them and that's how you try to define kind of uh, how good you can do. So that's how you s define the critical limits, the upper subcritical limit for uh, if you're doing uh, like a criticality experiment. Um, so I started with that sort of data here and I said, well, uh, just as an easy, easy problem, what if I just have a cylinder of plutonium uh, with a reflector on it and I say I only know the reflector's thickness to 5 to the minus 3 centimeters um, and then I just perturb in there. So for this particular example, uh, kind of what I was trying to impress upon the people who were paying me is that uh, for these type of cases, especially relevant to this uh, K-effective data is a lot of times we don't have an infinite number of these criticality studies. Uh, so you just get a few and you can end up with uh, histograms that kind of look like this, kind of in the script. So my claim was, well, if you include those uncertainties, you might get a better, more descript uh, problem when you only have a few cases. So for the 10 samples, um, the top is the original histogram. This is the uh, Gaussian kernels applied to each one of the data. So this is uh, kind of contrived. I scaled everything to be the same height so they would look uh, like they were on the same scale. Um, so this was the final KDE, um, kind of what you expect. You get the smooth function. Um, this is another plot here. This is a, a radial plot. So this is, I just put this up here to kind of show where the uh, kind of features in this KDE actually come from to kind of prove to you and myself that this is a, a legitimate process. So basically this is uh, this KDE flipped on its side sharing an axis with this, the standardized estimates. So that's basically the estimate divided by the uncertainty. Uh, the precision's one, precision is one over the uncertainty. So you see uh, these points down here are low precision points down here, high precision. This is two standard deviations from the total population mean. Um, so when we're looking at this, we get this point here that's a low precision point and we get this kind of wide bump that looks like it's outside of uh, kind of the norm for the rest of them. Um, so that's kind of the benefit here is that uh, you, can, you can kind of pick up the features that are present in your problem with these outlying points. Um, so as kind of a more realistic uh, or more useful maybe example, we decided to look at a UF6 storage cylinder. Um, so this was actually part of another project altogether as well. But basically what we did is we said, uh, we have this UF6 storage cylinder. We're going to assume that we don't know anything about what's inside of it except for the total mass. And we assume that uh, it falls in line with all of the limits. So it, there's not, it's not overpressurized. Uh, there's not more 
in one phase and is allowed to be in that phase. Um, so with these cylinders, you have uh, what's called the heels. The heels is just stuff left over on the inside of the tank after it's been cleaned to be reused. Um, you can also get, uh, if you load the tank with gaseous UF6, basically what it does is sublimate to the walls. So we put in this solid region here to simulate sublimation. Uh, and then if you put it in and before it sublimates, you can have a liquid phase down here and a gaseous phase above. Um, just kind of some, some assumptions we made to uh, kind, kind of give us some results. Um, so what we did is we said for a, uh, an inspector scenario, um, what, what the inspector might not know or what the inspector wants to confirm, you want to confirm total uh, uranium mass or the, the total content in U-235. Uh, so we said each one of these zones, uh, gas, liquid, solid, and heels, can have individual enrichments. And we perturb those enrichments between half a percent and five percent. And we want to see the uncertainty in the final uh, neutron flux through this uh, detector ring around the cylinder to see uh, is that uncertainty just based on not knowing the isotopics and volume and mass in each of the phases enough to be outside of the uncertainty that you would get from your measurement? Um, so the big thing is with simulation, does the simulation agree with the measurement within the measurement uncertainty? Uh, we want to show that there's actually more uncertainty, excess uncertainty in the nominal parameters in the simulation uh, that can explain those disagreements. So basically played the same game, 300 simulations, n total neutron flux through the flux ring, uh, and then applied the kernel density estimate to that, uh, used just your standard numerical integration to get the uh, moments of the kernel density estimate and saw that we actually have somewhere around 30% uncertainty for the 5, 4.5% uncertainty in the isotopics. Um, so 30% is pretty high, definitely puts you outside of the range where you could definitely say, well, uh, our detector's not working because it doesn't agree with simulation. Your simulation not, might not be working because of things you don't know. So, uh, kind of, I'll just tell you how it's, how it's implemented now. Basically, uh, what we've done is there are no new flags needed in order to get this kernel density estimate analysis. Anytime that you run a sampler study uh, that uses one of the Monte Carlo codes, so de novo, Monaco, uh, not de novo, Monaco, Maverick, and uh, Kino. Can shift when shift comes out. Um, so anytime you're using uh, one of those Monte Carlo schemes, it'll automatically do this for you. You get the KDE. You also get uh, some KDE determined statistics. So we do the moments of the KDE. We added in uh, doing weighted, variance weighted uh, statistics. So variance weighted mean, variance weighted variance, those sorts of things. Um, basically what it looks like is now in your output directory, you just get a new file folder and the files for each one of those parameters you perturb. So conclusions, I mean the basic conclusion here is that accounting for the nominal parameter uncertainties is important. Uh, sampler does a good job of it. So if you're not using sampler and this is kind of something that interests you, the stochastic uncertainty quantification, sampler is a good tool. And that's it. Right on time. So the bandwidth parameter that we're using is not a standard bandwidth parameter. So we're taking the uncertainty and basically calling that our bandwidth. So it's akin to an adaptive bandwidth scheme. Uh, if you've seen that where uh, you, your bandwidth is basically a function of your result. Um, instead of doing uh, any sort of, we don't, we don't actually use the bandwidth parameter basically. So it's the uncertainty associated with the Monte Carlo estimate that becomes your bandwidth parameter. So that's why I say it's actually a weighted histogram, not a kernel density estimate. Is the, I guess the, the verbiage that we use to describe the things is a little bit different from a kernel density estimate. But weighted histograms have been used in the literature for 30 years. So there is some disagreement on the, uh, how you interpret them. And I'm, it, the jury's out on which side that I'm on, but it's, it's one way to interpret data such as this.
just roll. That's fine. Okay. Hey everyone, so I'm, I'm Joseph Cole, and this is going to be a talk on the work that I did over at Los Alamos National Laboratory for the summer uh, that we entitled A Computational Study of Uncertainties in the co pain. Uh, and so a what this talk is going to have is I'm just going to go over a quick introduction of the theory and everything that we did uh, in some, uh, future work and current work that we're doing at the moment. So the realm that this work all uh, encapsulates is a subfield of physics known as high energy density physics, which uh, takes parts from realms as astrophysics or high temperature plasma physics. Uh, some specific examples might be looking at supernovae or inertial confinement fusion. <clears throat> and to get a better understanding of the uh, basic physics that occur behind all these phenomena, uh, certain rad flow or radiation flow experiments, RB, have been constructed, uh, which are made up of a small foam cylinder target, which is connected on one end to a small uh, laser lit half hull rum or half rum, which is just a little gold cylinder that's hollow and is bombarded with lasers in the inside. And when it heats up real hot, it starts to emit radiation, which is then driven through the film target and propagates through. Uh, these rad flow experiments is that there is this well-known discrepancy between experimental and simulated results. Uh, there's this big gap between what is observed in simulation, what is observed in experiment, and no one's really been able to tell uh, where this uncertainty is coming from, and we, uh, a lot of efforts are being done to try and pinpoint that so that more high fidelity work can be done uh, to match simulation and experiment. <coughs> uh, parameters have already been studied for these experiments, where these uncertainties are coming from. Uh, some of the major characteristics that have already been looked at is the uniformity of the film target, uh, opacity uncertainties, and uncertainties in the equation of state used for the hydrodynamic uh, equations. The been done for these uh, might be like Pleiades, which is an older rad flow experiment. Same setup, the foam target, and a half rom. And this experiment was looking to measure the breakout time of radiation, which is the t just the time it took for radiation to propagate from one side of the film to the other. We did a big study to see how uh, uh, non-uniform foam would affect this breakout time, because all the experiments so far had assumed uniformity. And in this project, we wanted to look at some uh, parameters of interest that hadn't really had a whole lot of work done on them yet, mostly looking at that half ROM uh, radiation drive that pushes the radiation through the foam. Uh, because experiments and simulations so far assume that the radiation drive gives a Lambertian angular distribution, which means that the angular distribution of the radiation coming out is uh, just a cosine relative to the normal of the foam surface, if that makes sense. Radiation going through is a black body distribution, which means the frequency of the radiation is just a pure Planckian. <coughs> uh, the the half hole realm is yet to be fully characterized, so we don't actually know how accurate or inaccurate these assumptions may be. Uh, but there is some conjecture to say that there uh, is reason to believe that they're not totally accurate because the geometry of the hull rum, being a cylinder, uh, motivates that there might be more radiation coming out than going straight up to the foam. Uh, since it's made of gold, gold has known uh, emission bands of x-rays that could throw off the Planckian assumption for the frequency. Uh, this is just a picture of what I mean by hull rum, for those that don't know, just this little gold cylinder. And this is a depiction of what it would look like next to the foam target. And so you have radiation is generated in here. <clears throat> and so the experiment that we decided to look at in particular for this study is an experimental campaign currently going on at Los Alamos known as the COAX uh, experimental campaign. Diagnostic, which is designed specifically to help constrain further experiments of its type. Uh, it's set up just like other rad flow experiments where it's got a foam target and a hull rum, but the major difference of this experiment compared to other ones is the foam is heavily doped or laden with titanium. Uh, the reason it's doped with titanium 
is because they did some studies and found that titanium has an absorption capacity that hits the uh, energy range of the high frequency radiation that's sent out from the radiation drive that would allow it to interact and heat up with the, uh, with the very front of the radiation wave that's propagating through the foam. Since the high frequency radiation is what's going to be out of, of everything else since it's optically thin. Then, using the Krypton backlighter, they shine a Krypton backlighter through the side of the foam target and use uh, absorption spectros spectroscopy to infer a temperature profile of the titanium in the foam and then infer a temperature profile of the radiation front from the temperature profile of the titanium that they find because the titanium should be interacting with that front of the radiation wave. <clears throat> and so in particular, these assumptions of a Lambertian and black body distribution of the drive could mess with the assumptions placed that you can infer a radiation front from the titanium front because depending on how the drive is set up, it may affect how the radiation front actually interacts with the matter and deposits energy. And in this case, it might affect your ability to infer a radiation temperature profile from the titanium. <clears throat> and then this is just a picture of the coax diagnostic where this yellow part is the, uh, the half hull rum and these are the lasers bombarding the inside to the red titanium doped foam target encapsulated by a larger non-doped silicon oxide uh, foam. This would be the Krypton, the Krypton backlighter shines from the side and we can get a temperature profile of the foam. <coughs> now, to actually simulate this experiment, we used the code CASIO, which is a Los Alamos code. Uh, it's just a general radiation hydrodynamics code. And we set up the model so that we could perform calculations in 2D and RZ geometry with an orthogonal grid to take, uh, to take advantage of some symmetries of the problem. And we calculated radiation transport with an implicit Monte Carlo scheme uh, coupled with other hydrodynamic and energy transfer equations. <clears throat> and like I said before, uh, we haven't been able to fully characterize the half-ROM drive. So instead of actually directly simulating it, we modeled the half-ROM as a flat boundary source on the bottom surface of the foam. And we modeled the angular distribution as a cosine power. So our radiation intensity is proportional to a cosine power of theta, where theta is the angle relative to this normal line. And then uh, where P is the power. And P equals 1 will give us a pure Lambertian drive, which has been assumed in the past. It's just the Planckian distribution for frequency, where frequency is new. Uh, we only were able to consider uh, angular perturbations over the summer. Uh, and this is just a quick, nice little uh, picture of radiation distribution where this blue line is P equal 1 and gives a Lambertian distribution. Uh, so this is uh, directly radiation going directly up through the foam and then off to the side. As you can see, as P increases, we get a more forward peaked set of radiation and as P is decreased to say one half, we get a radiation distribution that's more out to the side, more close to a fully isotropic drive. So now I'm gonna show some results that we got just for three cases, where I'm gonna compare a radiation drive of P equals infinity, which is a totally monodirectional drive. So all the radiation is going straight up through the foam. Radiation drive of P equals four, which is slightly forward peaked, and a radiation drive of P half, which is slightly side peaked. And I'm going to compare these all to the results that we got from the pure Lambertian drive that is normally assumed. And so the way these graphs are set up, or they're a little small, but each of these graphs has the same x axis which is the height of the foam in micrometers. So this is the uh, side of the foam that's connected to the radiation drive all the way up to the opposite side of the foam. And this is for the center line of the foam, just going straight to the middle. And then this y-axis here is in EVs, where these top graphs are EVs of the radiation temperature, and these plots are the uh, EVs of the material temperature of the foam, where we have at half a nanosecond, one nanosecond, and one and a half nanosecond, so you can see the progression through time. The green line is the Lambertian drive, and the blue line is the monodirectional drive. So as you can see here, 
The monodirectional drive, as time progresses, had a has a radiation front and a temperature front that propagates far out ahead of the radiation front and the temperature front that's produced by the Lambertian drive. <coughs> but for the slightly forward peak drive, where peak is equal to 4, the line generally... There's not a whole lot of a significant difference that we found, uh, except for this, but this is generally just the noise found from the IMC that we used to calculate the radiation. And then the same thing we found for the uh, slightly side-peaked drive, where again, the lines were almost directly on top of each other. We didn't find a whole lot of a significant difference between this drive and the drive that was assumed. So all in all, uh, these results are not quite enough to, to make completely overarching conclusions on how these perturbations to the drive really affect the experiment itself, but we are able to say that uh, slight anisotropies in the radiation drive don't produce much of a significant effect, which might be good. Uh, and we know that the monodirectional case had large effects, so we need to look and see where, how much anisotropy we need to uh, introduce relative to the Lambertian distribution to really see a significant difference compared to the regular drive, so we can see how much uncertainty we really need to take care of. Uh, we did not get to consider frequency perturbations, uh, but we are working on it at the moment, and I wanted to show this plot. It is the opacity graph of the foam target, where this black line is the actual foam opacity, and the red line is the most important, is the opacity lines of the titanium. The, uh, the radiation drive is about 100 EVs, is what we can attain right now. So the Planckian lion's about right here. And we wanted to, we are looking at uh, extra Planckians imposed that peak at about 500 EVs and at about 1,000 EVs, because that's about the upper width which we could really realistically get from the drive. Uh, and those are most important because if we peak at around 500 EVs, we would really be hitting these large peaks in the titanium opacity and can theoretically be getting radiation fronts that have extra uh, interaction with the titanium and the foam. Whereas if we peek out here, uh, we could get radiation fronts that don't interact as much with the titanium and the foam. And we want to see how those affect uh, the assumptions of the coax experiment and whether or not uh, those um, undo the assumption that we can infer a radiation profile from the foam. And lastly, uh, we also were able to get motivation from this project to formulate uh, further study on the COAX campaign using reduced order models because, you know, complex codes like Casio that do all this work require a lot of time and a lot of effort uh, and a lot of processors to run. And given a nice uh, reduced order model, we could be able to perform more studies in a faster time uh, and be able to analyze results to get a better idea of really where these uncertainties lie. And once we're able to get an idea of where we need to look, we can perform further high fidelity studies like done here on those spots uh, to really get a better accurate depiction of how those uncertainties are working. Um, and that's, that's it. A little early. So I'm going to start. My name is Anil, and I spent my summer in Oak Ridge National Lab under the supervision of Dr. Sajid Chetanar, uh, who is the data analytics team uh, in reactor and nuclear systems division. So I was part of the online sensor and fault detection project, and I'm going to briefly summarize what I did during the summer. And if you start with the motivation for the project, Sensor reliability is critical for safe and economic operation of nuclear plants. 
This is achieved through calibrating the sensors in a timely manner. But there are thousands of sensors, therefore these methods are labor-intensive, expensive, and introduce the potential risk of additional fault. Using data analytics and machine learning techniques uh, can avoid these issues by identifying which sensors need calibration. If you develop a model that can say us what a sensor should read, and if you compare it with the actual readings, we can say that the sensor needs a calibration or not. So these techniques can do this by uh, using the different readings of multiple sensors to identify it based on uh, complex relations between the sensors, where the reactor is driven by the physics, therefore these readings are related to each other. We cannot see it, but machines can see it through the data. Therefore, uh, regression models can use the data to develop these uh, models to that can we use in online sensor fault detection. So this, the first part of the project is developing the models. Uh, my involvement was very limited for this part, therefore I'm going to quickly uh, skip. I just added two, okay, seems good. Uh, I just added two uh, sample models that I used in my part. The first one is auto associative neural network, which is a class of artificial neural networks that consists of an input layer, hidden layers, and an output layer. So the hidden layers help us to develop the complex, uh, ca ca uh, help us to develop nonlinear non non transformations uh, within the uh, within the training data, and it's captured by uh, these layers. Here you can see the different steps for it. So these steps will be important in future. Another method is support vector machines regression. So they are kernel-based machine learning uh, regression tool. So the idea is taking the data, finding a function that captures the data within a uh, band which has a width of epsilon. And also some points are allowed outside this band, but they will, uh, they will add penalty to our minimization process. So here are the steps of SVM. So it's simply a minimization process of the weight and the penalty added by the slack points. And people realize that this can be solved through Lagrangian expansion, and they applied the saddle point conditions to get rid of some coefficients. And the final form of uh, this method can be uh, given with this. So we had the experimental data source that we can use. So uh, the data came from the AMS corporation. So it's a complete loop with having the heater, heat exchanger, pump, and pressurizer. There were 19 sensors, 20 different data sets. Two of them are normal that can be used in training. Uh, 18 of them has different sensor fault modes. And uh, each data set has 19 sensors with 10 to the 5 data points. This number will be important. So any regression model can be developed using this data. But here comes my part. What is the associated uncertainty with the model prediction? So if you're going to compare it with the actual readings, we need to know what is the risk we are taking with using the, using the model prediction. We can have an error estimate, which is a training error, but it shows us how the model is trained and what is the error during this training with the given data. However, this does not imply the performance of the models against the new data. But in order to make the prediction, we need to know what is the uncertainty of the model with the future data. The measure for that is generalization error. This will show us how the model will perform against the data that was not part of the training, but the problem is we cannot calculate it directly. So we have generalization error. We want to use it, but we cannot find it. On the other hand, we have training error, which does not give implication, but we can calculate it. Therefore, the generalization equations can give us the bounds how this generalization error and the training error are actually related to each other. So if you dig in some theory, the learning, learning is actually the problem of finding a relations, be, relationship between two variables, x and y. 
So these two are related with an unknown probability distribution, p x y. We don't know it, and we want to know, and we can approximate it with estimate functions f. So f is any function that takes the x as an input and makes an estimation on the value of y. So the estimate function is also an element of a bigger hypothesis space, which is denoted with the capital F. And capital F is the set of all possible functions that can be returned by the model. So if you think of the neural networks, the estimate function is a network structure with weights for each neuron. And the hypothesis space is the space that all possible combinations of weights. You can imagine how big is this space. So f can give any estimation on the values of x. Uh, this can be close to the real value of y, or it can be far. So the performance of this model is uh, determined with the expected error, or the true error. So true error is the integration of the cost function of making a prediction over the whole probability distribution. So C is the cost function. It shows us what's the cost of making a prediction on Y using the estimate function F. So for any function F, the true error is the actual value you have this model perform against the any possible data. But the problem is we cannot calculate it because we don't know the probability distribution. Instead, in practical applications of machine learning, we have finite sample size with the uh, size of L. We, we, uh, by using the same approach, we can estimate the error of our estimate function in our data space. This is called the empirical error, and we can find it by finding the cost of uh, making prediction at each point and then averaging it. So if the cost function is a square loss, where it's the square of the prediction uh, minus the actual value, this becomes the famous mean square error. So we have two error values, and there are some functions that actually minimizes these. So the best function, f star, minimizes the expected error over the hypothesis space. So this is the best possible function we can have. This will be the best function in the hypothesis space, but the problem is we cannot find it because we don't know, we cannot calculate the uh, true error. Instead, similarly, we can also define a suitable function, f hat, which minimizes the empirical error over the hypothesis space. So in theory, we can calculate it because we can calculate the empirical error. So in a consistent model, in a good model, if we have the infinite number of samples, the errors of these two functions needs to be same. But we don't have infinite numbers, therefore, a generalization theory, which is uh, defined by a, a mathematician, Vladimir Wapnik, actually states that for a finite sample, the error of the suitable function is within the epsilon band of the error of best function with probability of 1 minus delta, whatever the underlying probability distribution is. Therefore, if a model uh, satisfies these equations, it shows that the model is consistent. It can be used to make prediction. But the first problem is how to find the delta. So mathematicians also define that the delta has a generic form, which is a combination of a, of a growth function and an exponential function. So the growth function is a function of hypothesis space, the error, and the sample size. And the exponential part also is a function of the error and the sample size. Another mathematician, uh, David Pollard, uh, proposed that actually this generic form can be defined using a number which is called the covering number. And the exponential part has this form. So now the uh, problem can be converged into finding the covering number. And uh, find, uh, covering number, by the way, uh, it's the, it's, it can be defined as the minimum number of balls uh, that is required with radius epsilon is needed to cover the hypothesis space. So it's kind of a measure. Uh, it's, it shows that um, the whole hypothesis space actually can be covered uh, 
uh, with these uh, small balls. Uh, finding this number is not an easy task. Actually, function-specific covering numbers, actually, they do not exist. We don't know it. People can only approximate it using different uh, mathematical techniques. And one of them is using a property called Lipschitz co uh, continuity. So Lipschitz continuous functions are functions that has a limited growth rate. So their growth are limited in space by a constant, which is called the Lipschitz constant. And uh, this illustration is good to show it. Uh, the Lipschitz constant forms two lines, and the function will always be within those lines, whatever the x value is. So using it with the, uh, with the bonds in the weights of an estimate function, actually we can give an upper bond on the covering number, which is given by this number. So it's like approaching the problem. If I don't know, if I don't know the covering number of this weird shape, but I can uh, put them in a known geometric shape, and then say that at least it has it has a it has this maximum number of covering number. So it's still we don't know the actual value, but at least we can give an upper bound. If you use this upper bound in the Pollard's equation, now we have the generalization equation for our functions. That's what I did. So all steps of A and N actually can be written with a single function. And by using the function analysis and internal arithmetics, we can prove that uh, if, it has a, if it satisfies the Lipschitz continuity and if it if does it have a Lipschitz constant. So it has. And uh, if you plug, if you, uh, using it, we can find the covering number. And using this covering number, we can define the generalization equation for our A and N. We can also do the same thing to the support vector machines, which gives us the generalization equations of SVM using the covering number uh, for it. So what does this equations mean? The first thing is we said that in a consistent model, this, uh, uh, the, uh, any, any consistent model should, satisfies the, should satisfy the Wapnex generalization form. And by proving that these equations exist, we also proved that the ANN and SVM are actually consistent models. And they can be used to learn to make a prediction. So it's kind of a mathematical proof that these models can be used to uh, solve the underlying sensor calibration problem. It's kind of a verification. And also, the form of these uh, equations uh, gives us how the sample size change for each, uh, each approach. So the sample size is proportional to the two times the input dimension, input vector dimension in SVM, and the total number of parameters in ANN. For our problems, the SVM, uh, the 2D equals to 8, and the phi equals to 7 to 5. Therefore, the covering number in ANN is increasing much faster compared to SVM. Therefore, in order to keep the confidence level, if you add more sensors, we need to uh, provide more training data to ANN. Also, the solution exists for some cases uh, for our problem. And uh, for SVM, the solution exists when the error value is 44% with 90% confidence. This is not a good value, but still, it gives us the upper limit if we feed more training data, it will be better and better. The solution for ANN does not exist with the AMS data. In order to have the comparable error and confidence levels, we need 10 times more data for ANN. And if you want to define specific error and confidence, for example, in order to have a 10% error and 90% confidence, the required number is 20. 2.5 million for SVM and 25 million for ANN. And this concludes that the SVM is actually a more, efi more efficient method in terms of generalizability apart from the model development part of the project. Uh, SVM is uh, more efficient compared to ANN. So that's, that's all.